Welcome to Bible study with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church. I'm glad you've chosen to join me again. This is the first lesson in a series that will take us through July and August of the summer of 2022. We are going to focus on joy in Scripture. I'll share with you accounts from both the Old and New Testament, or Hebrew Scripture and Christian Scripture, about joy. Times that Scripture tells us that people are filled with joy or are joyful or respond with joy and how those circumstances may or may not be surprising to us to discover that joy is the response. So again, this is our first lesson in this series, and each week we will post a new video with an additional lesson in this series in July and August. As we begin our study together, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for the emotion, the feeling, the reaction that is called joy. We thank you for this feeling of overwhelming happiness that calls us to respond in ways that show visually and audibly with our body and our actions and our words and our facial expressions that we are excited, that we are pleased, that we are satisfied, that we just can't contain within us the amount of pleasant emotion we are having in response to what you have done. Guide us as we discover joy in scripture Allow us to be challenged to be more joyful in our own spiritual lives. May we better understand joy as a holy response. Allow your Holy Spirit to fill us, to sustain us, and to make us joyful as we now open Scripture to hear and better understand your word to us. We ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. So it might sound odd, but I'm going to start our study on joy in part of Hebrew scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus. So we're going to read Leviticus chapter 9. I've selected some verses from this chapter on worship during the time of the Exodus. So this is when Moses has led the Israelite people from the bondage of slavery into freedom. And now they've been journeying for several years in the desert, in the wilderness, and Moses' older brother Aaron has been selected to be the high priest over the people and his sons and then grandsons and great-grandsons, etc., will inherit this priestly role. They've built a tabernacle, a worship space, based on very specific instructions from God. And now they're about to have their inaugural, their very first worship service, following the directions God has given through Moses, his commandments, to Aaron and the other priests. And here is how their first worship service, as now the Israelite people during the Exodus, owning this identity as the chosen people of the one true God. Let's find out how their worship service goes. On the eighth day, Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Moses said to Aaron, take a bull calf for your sin offering and a ram for your burnt offering, both without defect and present them before the Lord. Then say to the Israelites, take a male goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, both a year old without defect, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a fellowship offering to sacrifice before the Lord, together with a grain offering mixed with olive oil. For today the Lord will appear to you. They took the things Moses commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the entire assembly came near and stood before the Lord. Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded you to do, so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses said to Aaron, Come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and the people. Sacrifice the offering that is for the people, and make atonement for them, as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron came to the altar and slaughtered the calf as a sin offering for himself. His son brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger into the blood and put it on the horns of the altar. Then Aaron slaughtered the burnt offering. His sons handed him the blood, and he splashed it against the sides of the altar. Aaron then brought the offering that was for the people. He took the goat for the people's sin offering and slaughtered it and offered it for a sin offering, as he did with the first one. Aaron also brought the grain offering, 
took a handful of it and burned it on the altar in addition to the morning's burnt offering. He slaughtered the ox and the ram as a fellowship offering for the people. Then Aaron lifted his hands towards the people and blessed them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. So this very first worship service for the Israelites, the very first time as freed people, not slaves, now in a place where they can worship openly, not the gods of the Egyptian people, but the one true God. They are now free to worship. They've been given guidance, commandments from God through Moses, instructions on what is worship. How do you worship? And they discovered that the main focus of their worship life is penitence, is acts of sacrifice, is atoning for one's sin, is saying to God, we have fallen short, we've broken promises, we haven't lived up to the goodness you created for us, and therefore we are sorry. And we desire for something or someone to be punished as an atonement for our sin. And then we intend to move forward having repented, having turned away from sin, paid the price of that sin. Now we'll move towards the good intentions you have for us, God, and be better, be better reflections of your good intentions at the moment of creation for humanity before sin entered the world. And so the worship service is Aaron, the high priest, making an offering for his own personal sins so he can repent and be forgiven as he begins the worship service. Then he makes offerings on behalf of the entire community of people, the collective sins of the community, and acknowledging that each individual has their own sins, and that's another offering. Then the offerings are received by God, and in response, God affirms God's divine presence and affirmation of what has happened. So the people make the sacrifices, then God responds. Aaron slaughters the animals, goes through the very detailed instructions on how to do that in a way that will be clean and pure and will be honoring to God. Goats, rams, oxen, grain are used. We use the term now scapegoat, transferring your sin onto another animal. So punishment occurs because what you have done is broken God's good intentions for the world. And this atones for that sin. Then once all of these rituals have been performed, all of the liturgy, the work of the people, the actions, the rituals of worship, in response, at the end of the worship service, God shows forth in a brilliant, divine, authenticating action, this holy fire that comes down and only consumes the offering and not the tent, doesn't harm the people, doesn't burn the altar. The supernatural fire just consumes the animals that have been slaughtered and offered as sin offerings. The people respond. When they see this divine fire from heaven, it says, they are filled with joy and they fall down on their faces you know, to offer this act of worship and awe. So their first response is to shout out, wow, like, God, this is amazing. We, we, we're so excited and thankful. Now we worship you when they bow down. So their response to this first act of worship, this first corporate worship service, this first congregational service of worship to God, which mainly is focused on confession and atonement, repentance, and the assurance of the pardon or forgiveness from God, then they respond with joy and this amazing humility as they're in awe of God's response to them. Now, this is how we worship today. In the Reformed tradition in the Presbyterian Church, part of our worship service, usually at the beginning of our service, is to have a prayer of confession where we together in one voice ask for God's forgiveness and atone for the sins of all people. So when we speak that prayer of confession in unison, 
We're not only speaking it for ourselves, but for those who maybe will not confess, cannot confess, are not aware of the need to confess of sin. So sometimes you might say words in that prayer of confession that you say, well, I haven't done that. Well, you're not praying only for yourself. You're praying for your household, your community, your nation, your world, the entirety of human race over time and place and people and saying, collectively, we are sinners and collectively, we desire to be in better relationship with God and to be healed, to be forgiven. And then in our congregation, we have a moment of silence about 30 seconds of silence in worship, where you're invited to do silent prayers of confession, where you can directly speak to God, ask for forgiveness, repent of what you believe you've done wrong. And it's private between you and God. That's why it's silent. It's in your head. It's in your heart. It does not need to be spoken aloud. No one else needs to know your business. No one else needs to hear you air your dirty laundry. It's not done through a priest. It's not done through a mediator. It's not done through a counselor or an elder or a deacon. It's you directly speaking to God so that God knows what's on your heart. It's our attempt to share our individual sins with God, to say how sorry we are and how much we desire to repent, to turn away from that behavior and towards things that honor God and honor the goodness that's intended in us. Then we as a congregation assure ourselves with confidence that God has heard our prayers, God receives our prayers with gratitude and eagerness, and God responds with love, mercy, and grace to forgive us. So we proclaim that good news. We say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and we respond and say, thanks be to God. Then our worship service continues with acts of proclamation and prayer and affirmation and offering and music, all done corporately, all done together as a community of faith to acknowledge our personal relationship with God, our personal direct open communication link to God in prayer, and our community life, and our responsibility as a brother and sister, not only in Christ, but a brother and sister in humanity to all other people created in the image of God. So my question to you is, like the early Israelites in this first worship service, is your response to worship, especially the portion of worship where we confess, where we ask, for God's forgiveness, when we repent, and then we receive this affirmation, this assurance of God's pardon, of God's love and grace to us, does that bring you joy? Is that the part of the worship service where you respond with a shout and exclamation of joyfulness and then fall down on your face just in awe and wonder and worshipful before our Lord? Is that the part of the worship service that tugs on your heart? I'm gonna guess probably not. I'm gonna assume, just based on the experience I have as a pastor, that that part of the worship service probably is not the most moving to you on every Sunday. Maybe the music is, maybe a particular sermon is, a particular testimony, even a moment for mission, maybe even the benediction or a special musical meditation that's offered, maybe even the children's sermon or the passing of the peace, or even the fellowship time after worship might be more moving or touching or feel more spiritual to you and feel like you want to respond with joy that morning. Yet scripture shows us that the first moment where the Israelites responded with joy to a worship service was when that worship service was completely and entirely focused on atoning for one's sins, on acknowledging the brokenness of our own self, because of sin and saying we wanted to make ourselves right in the eyes of God, making sacrifices, obeying the instructions for how to do that, honoring the priestly role, being together, allowing individuals and the community and corporate prayer for all others, and then witnessing God's response that God says, yes, I hear you, I respond, and have confidence, be affirmed, know with satisfaction, God says, that you are forgiven and loved. That's what gives them joy. That's the moment of worship that this response, this collective, wow, God, this is so amazing. I'm so thankful, I'm so joyful, I'm just bubbling over, and all I can do is just bow down and worship you now. If we want to be more like first people to acknowledge the one true God. If we want to be more biblical in our worship, 
then maybe, just maybe, we need to consider how we respond to that act of confessing our sin and being assured of God's pardon, the gift of forgiveness to us in worship. How can that portion of our worship liturgy, the work of the people together before God, how can that act of worship stir us to joyful response? I encourage you to kind of meditate and think about that, pray about that. The next time you worship with us, whether it be here in person in our sanctuary at 1030 on a Sunday morning or at your convenience at home or wherever you may be, through our online videos of our worship services, when that time comes in the service for the prayer of confession, the silent prayers, and the assurance of forgiveness, think about how that makes you feel. What emotions does that bring out in you? Is it an emotion of guilt, shame, humility, boredom even? Or is it joy? Is it enthusiasm? Is it awestruck wonder? And if it isn't joy, why? What are you wrestling with that's a hurdle? How could that act of confession, that prayer, that affirmation that we receive from the worship leader that we are forgiven, how can that really sink in so that we can respond with joy, with enthusiasm, with gratitude, with humility, with awe, with the desire to continue to worship our God. This is one example of joy in scripture. One example of a joyful response to what God is doing in the lives of God's people. I encourage you to be joy-filled. I encourage you to wrestle with how you respond to worship, especially to confession, and to the act of being open before God acknowledging that we are all sinners in need of a savior. And when we hear that assurance, that affirmation, those words of confidence that we are forgiven, and we respond with thanks be to God, are we just paying God lip service or are we really thankful, joyful, ecstatic even, awestruck, just, just humbled, overwhelmed by what God is doing for us? Even though we're not worthy, even though we are still sinners, even though unfortunately we will sin again, God says, I love you. I know you. I created you to be good. That's my desire for you. Let's move forward and be better. Thank you for joining me for this first lesson in our series on joy in scripture. Again, I'll be offering a video each week. You're also encouraged to be part of our congregation's ministry with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church, you can find out more on our website, eppchurch.org. You can find the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church on YouTube and Facebook. You can reach out to us at 215-887-2544. And you can join us for worship every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. here in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. Thank you, and we'll see you for our next study.